Greetings students and welcome to my very first video on differential geometry. In this lesson I'm going to talk about curves. Curves are basically the foundation of differential geometry so it's quite prudent to start differential geometry by talking about them. In two dimensions we can describe a curve as y as a function of x. Of course we can also move everything to the left hand side and end up with an equation that looks something like f of x comma y equals some constant k. These two forms are equivalent and in fact f of x comma y equals k is actually more general than y of x because in many cases it's really difficult to isolate y so we would rather just leave things as f of x comma y equals k. Now if we want to use math notation we can describe the curve c as a set of points x comma y such that if we apply the function f to x comma y we get the constant capital K. For those of you that are unfamiliar with math notation these braces mean that C is a set so in this case it's a set of points. The first statement in the braces means that the curve C is defined by a set of ordered pairs that are real numbers while this vertical line means such that. This should cover curves in two dimensions but what about curves in three dimensions? Well, curves in three dimensions are defined a bit differently. Instead of using an ordered pair, we use an ordered triple, obviously because we're working in three dimensions. Now this ordered triple has to satisfy f1 of x, y, and z equals k1, and f2 of x, y, and z equals k2. Now you might ask, why does it have to satisfy two equations, this f1 equation and this f2 equation? Well, let's take these equations and break them down first. In theory, what we can do is we can isolate the z from this f1 equation and we can do the same for the f2 equation. When we do that, we'll get z as a function g1 of x and y from the f1 equation and z as a function g2 of x and y from the f2 equation. Now we can see that this first equation for z is just a surface because it takes x and y spits out a z and does this for many pairs x and y. The same applies to the second equation for z, so both of these equations actually represent surfaces in three dimensions. But if they represent surfaces then how do we end up with a curve from these surfaces? Well it's because when we write the comma or the and in our definition for the three dimensional curve c, we mean the intersection of these two surfaces and the intersection of two surfaces is obviously a curve. So the curve C in three dimensions is defined by the order triples found in the intersection between the two surfaces given by the F1 equation and the F2 equation. These are just some ways to represent curves in two dimensions and three dimensions. And when we write curves in this way by saying that some function of x, y, and or z is a constant, the curves that we're writing are called level curves. The idea here is that if we go to our two-dimensional example then we can plot the surface given by f of x comma y. Then what we can do is plot the plane given by the constant k and our 2D curve would then be defined by the intersection of f of x and y and the plane given by z equals k. In other words, our curve would be defined by the value of f of x comma y at the level of capital K and this is why we call it a level curve. In differential geometry we tend not to use level curves as much, we tend to use something called parametrized curves. So let's define parametrized curves. A parametrized curve is a map gamma and what that map does is it takes a real parameter t and maps it to some ordered n-tuple of real numbers. For instance, if I take a real number t and map it to a triple of real numbers x, y, and z, then I'll get a curve in three dimensions. As I said, t is a real number and in many cases the curve that we define is actually finite and what that means is that t is constrained to lie between two constants alpha and beta which themselves are also real numbers. I can express a parametrized map as a vector with each element of that vector representing a separate coordinate that acts as a function of the parameter t. For example, a parametrized curve in three dimensions can be written as gamma of t equals x of t, y of t, and z of t. The nice thing about parametrized curves is that intuitively we can think of the parameter t as the time 
and as time increases we actually trace out the path of the parametric curve. Now the goal of differential geometry is to use calculus to work with curves and surfaces, and in order to use calculus we need to be able to differentiate our curves and surfaces. And this brings me to the definition of smooth functions, which is that a function f of t is smooth on the open interval from alpha to beta if the derivative of f of t exists for all n is greater than or equal to 1 and all t that lie in that interval alpha to beta. In other words, a smooth function is basically a function that's infinitely differentiable. This is just a single function though, but what about a curve? Well, let's take out our gamma of t from above. In order to differentiate gamma, all we need to do is differentiate its individual components so that the nth derivative of gamma with respect to t is given by a vector whose components are the nth derivative of gamma 1, comma, the nth derivative of gamma 2, comma, the nth derivative of gamma 3, and you get the idea. Now a parametrized curve gamma of t given by this vector valued function is smooth between t equals alpha and t equals beta if all its derivatives exist between alpha and beta. And in order to make sure that this happens, we need to ensure that all the components of gamma, so the gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, all of them are infinitely differentiable. Now the last definition I'm going to mention in this video is the definition of the tangent vector to the parametrized curve gamma. This definition says that the tangent vector of gamma of t at the parameter value t is just d gamma by dt. A lot of this lesson has basically been a definition dump but now I'm going to change that and do a very quick example that should consolidate a bit of what we've learned so far. In this example, we have to find the parametrized version of the level curve given by y squared minus x squared equals 1, so we basically have to convert a level curve to a parametrized curve. And then once we get the parametrized curve, we need to find the tangent vector of that curve. So let's start with part A. Now, just as a tip, Whenever you're confronted with a problem that asks you to convert between a level curve and a parametrized curve, the easiest option is to let x equal t and solve for y as a function of t. If we do that, we'll find that y squared is 1 plus t squared, which means that y is the square root of 1 plus t squared. But there's actually a problem with this method. In the original equation we had, we had y squared minus x squared equals 1. And from this equation, there didn't seem to be any restrictions on x and y. x could be any real number, positive or negative, and so could y. But in this final equation that we derived for y, it's only possible for y to take on positive values of the square root, so we'll have to make an allowance by letting y equal plus or minus the square root of 1 plus t squared. But we'd prefer not to do that, because if I substitute a single value of t into the parametric equation for y, then I can either get a positive number or a negative number, which kind of goes against the definition of a function. We can't have two possible outputs for a single input. Instead, it's probably ideal to get a parametrization where the parametric equations don't involve this confusing plus or minus. And we can actually do that if we use this secant tangent trig identity. We know that secant squared minus tangent squared equals 1, and this very strongly resembles the y squared minus x squared equals 1 equation, just with the y being replaced by the secant and the x being replaced by the tangent. So all we have to do for our parametrization is to let gamma of t, which is x of t and y of t, equal tangent t comma secant t. With this parametrization, secant and tangent can both take on positive and negative values. The one exception is that at odd multiples of pi by 2, secant and tangent are both undefined. So the best we can do is define our parametric curve at the open intervals, negative pi by 2 to pi by 2 and pi by 2 to 3 pi by 2. And that should do it for part A. But what about part B? Well, to find the tangent vector, all we have to do is find d gamma by dt, and that just involves differentiating the components of gamma separately. I'll assume you guys know how to differentiate trigonometric ratios, so I'll just straight up give you the answer, which is secant squared of t comma secant t times tangent t. 
Again, the same restrictions on t apply to the tangent vectors that they did to the actual parametric curve. Anyway, that should do it for this lecture. In the next lesson, I'm going to continue our lectures about curves by talking about arc length. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description for you to check out. And that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.